This next story is a personal favourite. The Tale of Inokibriel the Crow. In a far-flung kingdom, a land that has lost its name to time, there lived a grand king and his three daughters. The king doted on his children, caring for them and cherishing them. However, one by one, the princesses fell sick, caught with the Permian cough. Wise men and women, healers of all castes, travelled the lands at the king's behest, all trying their magics and their tinctures, but to no avail. Until Inokibriel arrived, his slick black feathers standing in stark relief against the marble walls of the palace, the crow walked straight past the guards, directly to the king's throne, and kneeled before him. The king, taken aback by this crowkin's direct approach, recoiled from the stranger. The animal kin people were less common back in those days, and even more so in this far-flung kingdom, far from the sands of the Grand Tronk Desert. Inokibriel spoke then, seeing the discomfort of the king, and he offered a choice. The king's wealth for his first daughter, the king's kingdom for his second, and the king's life for the third. There was an immediate uproar in the throne room. The king's court couldn't believe what they were hearing. They all rose to protest that surely this crow man couldn't be serious. The king silenced them all with a wave from his hand. To save his beloved daughters, he would do anything, pay any price. Inokibriel nodded once and turned to the tower where the three ailing princesses were, his stride purposeful and direct. He spent hours in their chamber, using rare herbs and performing unknown rituals, tapping into the power of his patron. And those hours turned into days, those days into a week until the crow emerged. The disease had been beaten and the daughters had been saved. News spread around the castle in a heartbeat, everyone rejoicing that the beloved daughters of the king would live. And so Inokibriel made his way to the throne room, ready to claim his rewards, the cost of saving the three maidens. Instead, he found a wall of shields between him and the throne, spears leveled at him from all directions. In the time Inokibriel was locked away in that tower, the royal court had poisoned the king against him telling the king that this must be no healer. The demands were too high. Think of your citizens, not to mention that you will die yourself if you pay his cost. The king had listened against his better judgment and had laid a trap. Inokibriel spoke then, surrounded by steel on all sides. He looked the king in the eye and spoke of how he had saved his daughters, that his price was due. His voice held the tones of sadness, not of anger, as if he were expecting this outcome but had hoped for the better. The king scoffed. What will you do, little crow? How will you claim your price with my soldiers betwixt you and the rest? Inokibriel simply shook his head and began to walk away. As he did so, the ground began to shake, the very stones of the castle beginning to break apart under the strain, waves of force emanating from Inokibriel himself as he walked and walked and walked. Of course, the soldiers tried to stop him, stop this demon cloaked in flesh, but none could stop his inexorable march. The kingdom began to collapse where he walked, the streets falling in on themselves, buildings collapsing under their own weight. The first price for the first daughter's life had been paid. Next, the crow turned upon the king's treasury, a squat building with a magitech lock upon the door so that none but the king's most trusted could enter. Inokibriel stood at the entrance, and the heavy steel door swung open. The crow smiled, and the room began to fill with a dark fire, spreading across the gold and the jewels. When he finally turned away, there was nothing left, and the king had paid his second price. Inokibriel made his way through the shattered streets. Slow and steady, his footsteps echoed through the rubble of the once grand kingdom. He made his way to the king's throne room. There, the last of the soldiers who hadn't fallen to Inokibriel's magics, stood ready to defend their king. When the giant wooden doors burst open, they unleashed volley after volley of arrow from their bows. Inokibriel didn't move, not once, and yet not a single arrow pierced him. He waved his hand, and with that simple motion the soldiers collapsed, pinned down by an invisible weight, unable to rise in defense of their foolish king. The crow reached the throne, placed one hand onto the king's chest, and took his third and final price. Inokibriel walked away. His work was done and his patron satisfied. On to the next, he felt the words in his head. Yes, master, came his reply. 
I suppose those who are attending have one thing to learn from this simple tale. If you make a deal, stick to it, lest you lose everything that you hold dear. The Lorelei are a strange species on Pontus, each unique from the other aquatic humanoid species, and indeed from each other in several key ways. They boast both a land form and an aquatic form, both of which are distinct enough from the other that you would be hard-pressed to recognize the Lorelei after a transformation unless you watched the transformation itself take place. There are, of course, sirens and mermaids across the deep waters of Pontus. However, these are only capable of transforming their lower half, in the case of mermaids, or have a fixed aquatic form, as with sirens. The Lorelei, having these two distinct forms, and seeming to metamorphosize between these, very much like a druid taking on a bestial form. I would posit that this suggests that these beings are perhaps some form of specifically aquatic druids, whom can only shift into one form, known henceforth as their aspect. Each Lorelei has an aspect of a different sea creature, from the mega shark all the way to the clownfish. This seems to inform their abilities within and out of combat, and also their aquatic form. A shark-aspected Lorelei will boast powerful jaws whilst in water form, and will have much restless energy in their humanoid form, seeming to never stop moving. They are each linked to one of the twelve moons, these seem to have a power hierarchy in reverse to the power of magic, which is strange. Being what appears to be a magical race, we would expect those who are under the Menorah's bracket to be the most powerful. However, the reverse is true, and the most powerful are within the Majoris bracket. This is obviously a complete contradiction to how magic is usually scaled, unless of course they are pulling their powers from the moons themselves, rather than the actual magical plane. Each of the distinct hierarchies within each moon cycle holds only 10 Lorelei with their individual aspects. There can only be 120 Lorelei, and there will always be 120. When one is killed, a new one is born to a woman who has touched salt water during their pregnancy. This child will seem like a normal child of the lineage of their parents until they come into contact with the oceans of Pontus. Much like the cool that the surface Rotola experience, the newborn Lorelei will feel a call to the waves. However, this is an irresistible call. The Lorelei are, also, without exception, female presenting. However, after speaking with several about their physiology, they appear to have no ability to carry a child of their own, and as such lack any of the physical parts that would facilitate such a pregnancy in the first place. The Lorelei are naturally capable magical users, though somewhat limited in their individual ranges. Their general magical capabilities are informed, just like their aquatic form, by their aspect. I had the great pleasure of interacting with the electric eel aspect, a Lorelei who called herself Nyx around 20 years ago. Her natural magical capabilities were, somewhat unsurprisingly, all related to lightning magics, some of which seemed like recognisable spells used by the greater magical populace. These all had some very interesting variation on the standard forms of spell, and most notably, the power of these magics were not affected by the standard Heaven's March of the Moons. Rather than being more powerful during the Menorah's reign, she was in fact more powerful during the Axelwise reign, the moon that is tied to her aspect. From our interactions with the Lorelei, some of which sadly have been in forms of captivity, mostly within the imperial courts of the human nation, we have learned that they seem to have a power-based hierarchy, the most powerful being the de facto leaders. The reigning leader is the top of the Majoris scale, and this, from all accounts, is an ancient being, the Cone Snail aspect. The Cone Snail aspect has been known to ally their considerable forces with the human imperial fleets, a strange choice of bedfellow considering the human empire's propensity to enslave and kill any other races they interact with, especially individuals of the Lorelei. Notable Lorelei from history include of course the Cone Snail aspect, the Mega Shark aspect, and the Giant Octopus aspect all known for their terrifying combat abilities, each having used their aquatic and non-aquatic forms to devastating effect in naval and land combats. However, the most famed of the Lorelei is in fact one of the weakest aspected Lorelei. I am of course talking about the clownfish aspect, who goes by the name of Cindy, the one who runs the Travelling Waterlife Park. This is a huge tourist destination across Pontus, despite its propensity to, of course, 
travel. When arriving in dock towns across the planet, it attracts hundreds of amazed onlookers each time. Speaking of the clownfish aspect, I have a personal theory regarding her potential combat abilities. Knowing what we do know about the natural defenses against toxicity and poison of the common clownfish, I believe that perhaps the only Lorelei who would be capable of dethroning the current cone snail aspect would be the clownfish aspect herself, as the cone snail is renowned for her abilities with poison, with no other particularly notable combat abilities being reported. This would mean that the natural immunities of the clownfish aspect would potentially counteract this deadly ability, and as such render the cone snail aspect disarmed in the face of the combatant. Lorelei also seemed to boast an extended lifespan beyond that of any other race across Pontus, potentially being much like the goblins, that unless they meet a violent end, they will not die. Aging does not seem to be a worry for the Lorelei at the very least, my interactions with Nyx spanned across several years, and through all this time she seemed to not age a day. The Lorelei have a grand underwater city, which they are called to to commune with each other, though what they discuss during this is unknown as no outsiders are allowed. The city has held several names across the years, the Underwater Fortress, the Lorelei Cove to name the two most recent, However, from my own personal experience with Lorelei individuals, the Lorelei themselves do not have a name for this place, rather simply referring to it as home. This city's location is a closely guarded secret, and some believe that the city even moves, that perhaps the city itself is built on the back of some grand Lorelei, one whose aquatic form would be so monstrously large as to be able to hold a city upon itself. Sadly, I believe we will never be privy to that information. Yes, the Lorelei are a fascinating race indeed, made all the more interesting with how shadowed and secretive they are regarding the history of their race, the religious beliefs they hold, if any, and of course, even the location of their home. If any of you attending today have the chance to meet with and learn from a Lorelei, I would highly recommend that you jump on this opportunity post haste. A wealth of knowledge could be yours for the taking. Now, as the world-renowned cryptozoologist Sir Lionel Weiss once said. Hello Lore Masters, my name is Ashley Maligan, and thank you for listening to another episode of Tales from Pontus. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review us on iTunes, and let me know on my social media. Hearing people's opinions of the show will help us grow. Also, if you enjoyed the episode, please share with your friends. It's the only way we can reach new people at the moment, and it would mean the world to us. The music in this show was created by the incredibly talented Cameron Bloomer. Check out his stuff on Twitter, at the Lumpy Boy, and on Instagram, at Cameron Bloomer. That's spelt B-L-U-M-E-R. To hear more news about the show and what I'm involved in, follow me on Twitter, at Trashly M. That's T-R-A-S-H-L-E-I. GHM. Once again, a huge thank you for listening. May your cups be ever full and your hearts fuller still. Tales from Pontus is a Big Tin Media production.